but it's going to be Esther chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading the first few verses, but we're going to work through the entire chapter just about the same way we did last week. So if you read along with me. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit would illuminate us, Lord, that we would hear exactly what you would have us to hear. Lord, open our hearts. Our desire and longing is to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we began last week in our sermon series on the book of Esther, and we spent a little bit of time in introduction, and then kind of following that, we worked through the entire chapter, uh, the entire first chapter. And if you were not here last week, um, I just want to remind everybody that our sermon series are available on Facebook and YouTube, so you can always go back and watch them. Um, I encourage you to do that, but it's not necessary to uh, glean things from today's message. Each sermon uh, is going to be independent in and of itself, so uh, they'll stand on their own. So there's no pressure, just uh, I think it might be a blessing to you if you go back and watch. Um, and I began last week by saying the book of Esther is unlike any other book in the Bible. We have not one mention of God, we have no mention of prayer, and we said even the heroes were to some degree walking in disobedience. We said the main theme of the book was the providence of God and His protection for His people. We'll see that God is always in work in every situation. We also see that God uses imperfect people to complete His perfect plan. God knows the future, and He is absolutely in control, even in and especially when we can't see Him working. We said that when things look the darkest for God's people, He is always at work behind the scenes, providing a plan for protection. We went through our series on Daniel, and we talked a bit there, and we had uh, kind of mentioned the historical context, and we said that the Jews were brought into the promised land. They were led there, and they were given uh, some laws and statutes. And God says, hey, as long as you obey my laws, I will bless you. But if you uh, forget the Lord your God and you become disobedient, then I will bring discipline on you. And one of the things he said he would do is he would scatter them, right, for a time. They would be carried off. And so that's what happened. Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, actually the first, he, he besieged the city three different times, 605, 587, I'm sorry, 597, and 586. In 586, by the way, he ended up completely destroying the city. But we went through Daniel, and we talked about that discipline that came through Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And then the Jews, they spent 70 years in exile, 70 years in exile. And about the end of that time, a new empire rose to power. And that was the Medo-Persian Empire. And they came and they conquered the Babylonians. And a king by the name of Cyrus from the Medo-Persian Empire put out a decree allowing the Jews to return to their land and rebuild it. Now, it had been 70 years, and they now have this decree that they can go back and start rebuilding their land. The prophets had given instruction to the Jews that they were to return after the 70-year captivity was up. 
Zerubbabel actually led the first return, and many went back with him. We know there was also a return under Ezra and Nehemiah. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the walls. They reestablished worship. Um, But the Jews, they had to go back. See, they had to go back in order to be obedient, to obey the law, and to reestablish worship. It was necessary. We understand, though, that the Messiah hadn't come yet. Many of the prophecies were not yet fulfilled, so it had to happen. They had to go back. Now, there was a man we meet, and his name is Mordecai. He had adopted his cousin, and he had chose to remain where he was and not return. And I had mentioned that it was understandable to some degree because, I mean, you think about this. This is where these people had lived their entire lives. They spoke the language. They uh, had a place in their day-to-day living. Um, and the, many of the other Hebrews felt the same way. I mean, you can, you can imagine how that would be if, if you start to say, okay, well, there's 70 years of a Babylonian captivity, right? And now we're here, and chapter 2 is actually opening in 479. So you're like... 80 years out after the return should have happened, these people had been living there their entire lives for generations. And we know that the spiritual condition of the people was poor because we see that in Ezra and Nehemiah. But it was comfortable and it was a challenge to go back. Life would have been particularly hard. Remember when Nehemiah opens with the fact that the city walls had been destroyed and that they were constantly being attacked. So uh, it, was, it would have been a pretty hard life. So the temptation would have been, hmm, I'm in the capital city of the most wealthy empire in the world, and my family is here. Am I going to pack them up and take them back, or are we just going to live out our lives here? And the temptation would have been to stay where they were at. And we spent some time going through chapter 1 last week, and we talked about this great celebration and feast that was given by the king. We talked about his conquest that he was preparing to go into Greece And then we looked at how the king called for his wife, Queen Vashti, to come before the people, but yet she refused. And because of this, she was banished from coming before the king, and a decree was sent out. Now we're moving into chapter 2, and chapter 2 is taking place a few years later. We'll see in a moment that our text kind of points out that at one point it's the seventh year of his reign. We know chapter 1 opened in the third year, so now we're four years later in the seventh year of his reign. So some time has gone by. He's had this expedition, this conquest into Greece where he suffered a loss. And he came home and the queen was gone, right? So some time had passed since chapter 1, and, and we saw that decree was sent out to all the provinces. Ahasuerus had led his armies on that conquest, and he had failed to uh, conquer the Greeks, and he had returned home defeated, alone, and without a queen. And the Bible goes on to tell us, I think is what it's saying here, is that he missed her, and perhaps he wished that he hadn't made those decisions when he sent that decree. Look at verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Now, I touched on this a little bit last week, but I just want to make mention here that actions sometimes have permanent consequences. Our actions sometimes have permanent consequences. One of the things that uh, we had taken time to discuss before that was when a Persian king put out a decree, it could not be undone. Now, I won't go into explaining all of that again, but that was one of the things that was special. Remember, Daniel uh, had to go in the lion's den because they kind of duped King Darius, right? But then Darius found out, and he wanted Daniel not to go in the lion's den, but there was nothing he could do because that decree had gone out, and the decree of a Persian king could not be undone. So once he had put this decree out against Queen Vashti, there was no way he could undo it. And I did point out last week that this decision was made in anger, right? He was intoxicated and he was angry. We said that when people are intoxicated and especially angry, sometimes they don't make the best decisions. It says in verse 1 that, uh, <clears throat> that after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. And you know, our actions have consequences too. Sometimes those consequences are also permanent. They can never be undone. As I said last week, when we're angry, we sometimes say things that can never be unsaid. We sometimes do things that can never be changed. And that is why we must always seek the Lord for His wisdom and walk in His Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, the Bible says, we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
The flesh is a sinful nature that wars against the Spirit, and it draws us to do things that appeal to the flesh. Being angry in and of itself is not a sin, as long as the anger is just and we handle it properly. The Bible tells us not to let the sun go down on our anger. And there is a righteous anger, by the way, like when we see injustices taking place. Remember, Jesus got angry, right? Remember when he healed the man on the Sabbath and the religious leaders were critical of that? Jesus was angry, right? There is a righteous anger. But how we handle our anger always has consequences, either good or bad. And it would be easy to preach an entire sermon on anger and how destructive it is, but we'll save that for another time. But I'll tell you this, one of the things that anger does to you, especially anger that is held inside, will emotionally exhaust you. And I think we're living in a society and a time now where things are, people are very angry. And I think that anger is wearing them out emotionally. And I think that's why we have such an uptick in depression, to tell you the truth. It has to be channeled and handled properly. Now, Ahasuerus would obviously have been depressed too, right? I mean, think about this, right? He just lost a military campaign and he had lost his wife. He came home and, and his wife was gone. Now, it's understandable that he feels this way and it would appear that's what his servants noticed, right? They noticed it and they thought, hey, we got to do something to cheer up the king. So they came up with a, with a plan, with an idea. Look at verses two through four. So then the, uh, then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king and he did so. So we have a plan here to cheer up the king. So the king's servants come up with an idea. They should gather up young women from all across the empire and bring them to Shushan the citadel um, <clears throat> and put them under the custody of the king's eunuch and give them beauty treatments. And then the king will have his choice to pick someone to replace Queen Vashti. So let me say it again kind of another way. In other words, the servants saw that the king was, was depressed and they said, we have, to, we have to have an idea. We have to come up with something to help King Ahasuerus. So let's gather up the most beautiful women from around the empire. And then King Ahasuerus, you can choose a new queen. And the king had been through a lot in the last couple of years. So he decided like that sounded like a good idea. And verse four tells us that this thing pleased the king and he did so. Now, the king didn't know, and neither did any of his servants, that while they were doing these things and planning all of this, God was working in the background. He already knew that a man by the name of Haman was coming in the near future with a plan to destroy all of the Jews. There would not have been only the Jews, by the way, I want to remind us of this, not just the Jews that were there in Shushan, that was the Jews throughout the entire Persian Empire, which would have also included those who had returned to rebuild the temple and rebuild the land. His intention was to wipe out an entire race of people. It would have, uh, as I said, it would have included those in Jerusalem as well. But God would not allow that to happen. The search for a new queen was going to open the door for a character we're about to meet in the next few verses. Look at 5 through 7. 5 through 7. It says, in Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful." When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. We see there in 5 through 7, we're introduced to a man by the name of Mordecai. We're actually introduced to Esther as well, but a man by the name of Mordecai. He was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. His great-grandfather Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem in 597, that was the second siege there, by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we don't know how old Mordecai was, considering that the year is now 479 B.C., and that the Persians took over almost 80 years prior, but he had most likely lived his entire life under Persian rule. 
Mordecai had an uncle who had died and left his daughter Hadassah, who was Mordecai's cousin, as an orphan. And the Bible tells us that Mordecai stepped in and adopted his cousin and raised her as his own daughter. Esther had lost both her mother and father, and Mordecai stepped into this noble calling. See, Mordecai did the right thing. He did the right thing, and he was in the will of God, and God used it. You know, adoption is such a noble calling. There are many children out there who need parents. What an amazing thing it is when people step into that role and they raise these children as their own. You know, I've had the privilege of knowing a few families who have adopted children, and one of the most amazing things is to see that they love those children just the same as those that were given to them through birth. It's quite an amazing thing. And the Bible tells us that when we come to Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. You know, one of the names given for the Holy Spirit in the Bible is the spirit of adoption. God receives us into his family, and through faith in Jesus Christ, we are called the children of God. That's an amazing, amazing thought, by the way. And there's so many children also out there that need a loving home and family. You know, I personally believe adoption is a calling, something you should definitely pray about. But I praise God for those who step in the role or step up and get into the role and give those children a family, a home, and parents who love them. And Mordecai did this for his cousin Hadassah. Hadassah was her Hebrew name. Esther would be the Persian name. And so the search for the queen begins. Look at verses 8 through 14. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also, uh, Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her beside her allowance. Then seven choice maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maid servants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to. And every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go into the king Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months' preparation according to the regulations for the women, for there was, uh, this were the days of the preparation apportioned. Six months with oil and myrrh, six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go to the king again unless the king delighted in her and decided to call for her by name. So after the king's command went out, the young women from all over the kingdom were gathered. They were given these beauty treatments, and they would all be given an opportunity to go before the king. What was basically going to happen was that they were going to become a part of the king's harem, with the exception of one who would be named queen. They would be brought in, given those beauty treatments. It was saying there's six months of oil and myrrh and six months of perfume and other beauty treatments. And then they would have one night with the king. After that, they would be moved to a secondary house, which was for the concubines. They would no longer be allowed to marry, but they would belong to the king. And if the king so chose to call for them by name, then they would be brought back to the king. These ladies would have been allowed to choose specific things, probably jewelry and perfumes and such, to take with them from the house of the women when they went in to be with the king. And we meet Esther here, and we find out that she is one of these ladies that has been taken into the program of the king. Mordecai had given her some specific instructions, and he had told her not to reveal her people or family. That would be important later, by the way. We also see that Mordecai was also obviously very worried about her, 
And it says he paced outside of the woman's quarters every day to try to find out what was happening with Esther. I couldn't even imagine. But King Ahasuerus, he was looking for love in all the wrong places. We understand clearly that he was looking for love in the wrong way. Obviously, as the king, the physical beauty of the woman or the queen would have been of the utmost importance. And when we look back at his choice of Queen Vashti, the one description the Bible gives us of her was that she was beautiful, physically attractive. The Bible tells us that Esther was also beautiful. But we, as we will see in a moment, Esther had a humble spirit and an inner beauty that was, a, that was far more valuable than just her outward appearance. Our culture and society today are so shallow. It places so much emphasis on people's physical appearance Young women are constantly pressured to look a certain way in order to have perceived value. We're confronted constantly with immodest and inappropriate images. Whenever we turn on the television set or open a magazine or walk through the store, um, it's constant. And I want to say something to any young men who are listening today. Don't be deceived into believing the lie that a woman's value is found in her physical appearance. We now live in a time that would be considered a hookup generation where people get together to find out if they're compatible or just have an experience. You know, that doesn't sound much different than from what King Ahasuerus was doing, right? The Bible is very clear when it comes to sexual morality, that that relationship is only for a husband and wife. And I've labored many times to talk about the consequences that come from violating God's word on this particular issue. So we won't dive into that today. But young men, if you're looking for the character, characteristics of a good wife, Proverbs 31 is a great place to look. In verse 30, you don't have to turn there today for sake of time, I'll read it to you, says something very important. Proverbs 31, 30, it says this, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. Okay, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And then 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, talk about this as well. And I'll read that to you um, as well. And it talks about a humble and quiet spirit. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4 says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if you do not obey the word, they, meaning the husbands, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So Ahasuerus was going to find this gentle, humble, quiet spirit in Esther. And then verse 15, God's favor rests on the humble. Look at verse 15. It says, Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of of, uh, Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Notice Esther has already been mentioned as having obtained the favor of those who were in charge of her. And verse 15 says she had obtained the favor in the sight of all those who saw her. And now God was working here because she had that favor. She was humble and she took the advice and the guidance of the king's eunuch on what to do when she went in to see the king. The other women probably loaded themselves with lots of necklaces and bracelets, earrings, anklets, and other jewelry, but not Esther. She allowed who she was to define her beauty. We see the same humble spirit uh, in Daniel, who also obtained the favor of those who were placed in charge over him. We know that pride is obviously in opposition to God, but he always gives grace to the humble. Now, this is quite a story. Normally, the king would have chosen his wife from noble families, but here the search has reached out to people that would be considered common. Understand there's a picture here 
with the king of kings who reaches out to those who are lowly. Vashti, the queen, by the way, rejected the call of the king. But Esther responded to the call of the king. Remember in Mark chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, the scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus eating with what they considered to be sinners and tax collectors, uh, and they asked the disciples, how can he do that? And Jesus responded by telling them that he didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Of course, they're all sinners, but some refuse to accept it. Then finally, we see a queen is chosen. Look at verses 16 through 18. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the tenth month, in the month of Tebeth, in the, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther, for his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in all the provinces uh, and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. The Bible tells us that the king loved Esther more than all the other women. He put the royal crown on her head, and she became the queen to replace Vashti. See, God had moved Esther into the place that he wanted her a place where she would have an opportunity to save the entire nation of Israel. We also, just to mention there, you see it's the seventh year in the reign of Ahasuerus. That's four years since Vashti was removed. Two of those years, Ahasuerus was at war. And now finally, after four years, a queen had been named. The Bible goes on to tell us that the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther, And it says that it was uh, proclaimed a holiday and that they gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. So those gifts were probably a remission of taxes and maybe even military service as well. But it would not take long at all before God began to use Esther and also bring Mordecai's name into the history books. Look at verses 19 through 23 says, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat uh, within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gates, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Than and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when the inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Esther listened to the wisdom of the man who had raised her. She had not revealed that she was a Jew because Mordecai had told her not to. She honored his command, and this is important because when a plot comes against the Jews, she would have the opportunity to save them, and that's when this information is going to come out, and it's going to be the work of God. Mordecai was in a position that put him inside the king's gate. We don't know exactly what his position was. Some commentators have said he was a doorman, but we just don't know for sure. Either way, he was in a position which allowed him to learn about a plot to assassinate the king. Two of the king's eunuchs were planning to kill Ahasuerus. Now, a king always has a dangerous job, by the way. There's always somebody looking to take that from him. So it can be easy sometimes to say, boy, I wish I was king But that comes with a lot of worry and frustration, too. By the way, uh, King Ahasuerus would eventually be murdered, by the way, assassinated, by Artabanus, who was the captain of the guard, and Aspamitris, who was a eunuch, but not at this time. Mordecai got word of this plot beforehand, and he went to Esther and told her about the plan to assassinate the king. So Esther, after hearing this, took it and informed the king that Mordecai had given this information. Then an investigation was launched, and at that point, the plot was revealed and found to be true, and the two eunuchs were hanged. Now, 
<clears throat> when we see hanged here on a gallows, we tend to think of a gallows like when we play the game Hangman, where there's a rope hanging down that goes around the neck. That is not uh, what was being talked about here. It was more likely a form of uh, crucifixion or being impaled, uh, which was where there would be a spike and a person would be put down on that, and uh, the weight of their body would slowly pull them down. So it was an extremely graphic and painful uh, way to die, and it took quite a bit of time. So, uh, lesson, don't plot against the king, right? <laughs> and all of this was written into the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And later we will see that Mordecai doesn't receive any recognition at this point. But later the king's going to go back one sleepless night, and he's going to open up these Chronicles, and he's going to read it, and it's going to be a very significant part of the story. But I wanted to mention this because uh, I read something and I was kind of bothered by it, so I thought I would, would just mention it here. Um, and that's, there's a time to tell the truth. Quickly, uh, we noticed that Esther was commanded by Mordecai not to reveal who her family was and that she was Jewish. Some have said she was not being truthful, but that's simply not the case. Mordecai didn't ask her to be untruthful or to lie, but he basically told her uh, just not to come out and reveal certain things. Matthew Henry had a really great, great quote, and I liked it. It says, All truths are not to be spoken at all times, though an untruth is not to be spoken at any time. See, that makes sense, right? I mean, if uh, you were in um, Nazi-occupied Germany or, 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 and you had Jews in your house, you would not go out and say, Oh, i got to go tell the government the truth, right? <laughs> right? That's, um, that's, that's what it's kind of talking about here. So I thought it was kind of wrong to say that she was being deceitful. Um, Esther was born there in Persia and probably there in Shushan. So they assumed that she was Persian and nobody asked her. So she chose not to reveal her nationality until the appropriate time. And God was working all of this together for a purpose. And then finally, God reveals. Finally, God reveals. I want us to notice there in verse 23, and let's look at that again really quick. And when the inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on the gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. In verse 23, we notice that the truth of the plot was revealed, and justice was carried out. These men who plotted against the king would face justice for their actions. God was in the process of using all of these circumstances and situations to work out the protection of his people. It was not just by chance, by the way, that Mordecai found out about that plot. There was something behind that. And by the way, the Bible teaches us in Luke 12, 2 and 3, that the truth of sin will always come out. Sometimes it may be immediate, other times it may take a while, but the truth will always eventually come be revealed. Even if God chooses to wait until the final judgment, everything will eventually be revealed, nothing will be hidden, and justice will be carried out. That's why we need to put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We don't want justice. We want mercy and grace. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 2, and next week we'll pick up in chapter 3 where the plot thickens. We're going to meet a man named Haman, who was an Agagite, who, if you do your homework on that, there's a couple of different opinions, but it would seem like he was the descendant of one of the kings that Saul was supposed to have killed and didn't. And so uh, we have this man by the name of Haman. And Haman is going to offer an astronomical sum of money to eradicate an entire people. If I was to compare this to dollars, by the way, in, in our current situation, it would be trillions. It would be trillions. That's how much money Haman had, and that's how much Haman wanted to eradicate these people. So in conclusion, we'll pick that up next week. hope you all will be here. But in conclusion, there's a couple things I wanted to mention. Always seek to do the right thing. Always seek to do the right thing. Okay. Mordecai did the right thing, right? He didn't know what he was doing. He had no idea what Esther was going to do, but he saw the opportunity. He did the right thing, and God used him to raise this woman who would one day become king and save the empire. And also remember God's favor rests on the humble. God's favor rests on the humble. We not only see that in Esther, we see that as a common theme throughout the Bible. We know that the Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And finally, 
abide in truth, and walk in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's go ahead and have everyone stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And I just uh, want to mention, if there's anyone here that's watching us online or uh, who is um, e even here, and if you have never come to the place where you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do that today. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. It teaches that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But God is... In His infinite mercy, because He is holy and just and righteous, He cannot overlook sin. So He created a way in which sin could be punished and yet man could be forgiven. And that way is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's believing that Jesus died for sin on the cross. He was buried and He rose again the third day from the dead. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. See, it's the believing that saves. The confession of the mouth is an evidence of the work that's already taken place in the heart. And you can say a prayer, it's understand, it's not praying the prayer of salvation that saves you, it's believing and then confessing. And maybe it sounds something like this. Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and I ask you please to forgive my sin, come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. I repent and want to follow after you. The Bible says that all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and the name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to open your word. We thank you that uh, you've given it to us. And we ask as we go out, Lord, that uh, we, would, we would have boldness to share your love with people, Lord. It's a lost world out there, and there's a lot of people who need you. Lord, give us the boldness to do that and to, to preach the gospel and to share the gospel with those around us. Lord, carry us home today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so do we have any other announcements before we close today?